God bless, God bless. It's good to see you all. God bless you. Amen. Truly God is worthy to be praised. Worthy to be praised. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming. God bless you. God bless you, Angela. God bless you, Chuck. Chucky, God bless you, Veronica. God bless you, Joanne. God bless you, Elder Nicole and Trisha and Edna. God bless you, Lisa. Good evening to each and every one of you. Thank you for joining with me tonight. We're going to begin momentarily. God bless you, Jasmine. God bless you, Brenda, my cousin. God bless you. Hey, Elder Nicole. God bless you, James Suarez. Amen. Good to see you all. God bless you this evening. Thank God for this privilege that I have to share with you out of the word of God. Truly, his word is truth. And we thank God for it. And so God bless you all. Thank you for joining with me this evening. We pray that you would gather yourselves together, grab your Bibles, your paper, your pens, amen, tape recorders, whatever you want to gather to help you in your study time. And so we want to begin studying the Word of God. God bless you, Kilts. God bless you, or Quince. God bless you. Amen. Lisa, God bless you. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for joining with me. Amen. Veretta. God bless you. Thank you for joining with me tonight. Amen. And those of you who are joining Latest and, and others, um, if you feel so inclined, please share this on your page. God bless you, Sean and Eram, Miss Dorothy. God bless you. Um, please share this on your page so that others will know that we're on. Um, Chrissy, good to see you, my sister. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Paula, it's good to see you. Sean, what's going on, my brother? God bless you. Hunter, amen. Good evening, each and every one of you. Thank you for joining with me tonight. Amen. So good to see you all. Mary, God bless you. Amen. We glorify the name of our God and we thank him for this privilege that we have to study his holy word. Amen. And I'm so grateful for this opportunity to share with you out of the word of God. And so we're going to begin. Amen. Kiana, God bless you. Mary, good evening. Amen. And so let's begin our study. Siobhan, God bless you. Sister Siobhan, I hope you're feeling better. And how is uh, Amaya? God bless you. Kiana, God bless you. Amen. Amen. So let's begin in prayer, asking God for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And we thank God for this privilege. And I thank you for joining me tonight. Amen. So let us begin to pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come before you thanking you, Father, for this day that you've given us. God, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to study your word. And Father, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. And so, God, we thank you for this privilege, for your word is excellent. It is pure. It is just. Your word is inerrant. It is infallible. Your word is perfect. And Father, we know that your word is true. And Father, you said, by your word are your servants warned. And so, God, give us holy wisdom tonight. Holy Spirit of the living God, give us free flow tonight. Remove from us anything that would hinder us from hearing your voice. Lord God, you be our teacher tonight. You speak to our hearts tonight and our minds tonight that we might live stronger and better lives for you in the name of Jesus. For you said if the salt has lost its saltiness, then it is good for nothing but to be trampled under the feet of men and to be cast out. So, Father, we pray in Jesus' name that you would lead us tonight and that, God, you would give us holy revelation, practical information for our lives that we might live better. God, I pray for every marriage represented on this line, that, Father, in Jesus' name, you would strengthen every household in the name of Jesus, and that, Father, you would develop stronger the bonds and cords of love that cannot be broken between a husband and a wife. 
Father, I pray that you would dispel all arguments, dispel all untruths, Lord God. And Father, if there are any that are married to unsaved individuals, we pray for salvation over them in the name of Jesus. But God, if you lead us and guide us, we'll know the way to take. For you said a man plans his way, but the Lord orders their steps. So God, order our steps tonight in the name of Jesus, that we might live effective lives in the midst of this perverse and wicked generation. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. So protect our integrity, protect every word that is spoken, protect our hearts and our minds that only your voice would be heard. It's in Jesus name we pray and we thank you and we honor you tonight in Jesus name. Amen and amen. God bless each and every one of you. Oh, Siobhan, yeah, see, amen. So we keep on praying for her, amen. And we thank God for each and every one of you. If I did not get an opportunity to say good evening to you personally, uh, good evening to everybody. And thank you for joining me once again for this opportunity to study God's holy word. Truly, his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. And we thank him for his grace and his mercy. We thank him for every opportunity that he grants unto us to, to know more about him and to grow in the knowledge and the understanding of our God. And so truly there is life in his word. There is peace in his word. There is joy in his word. And because his word is excellent and his word is pure, listen, if we follow his word, we will have true direction. And so we want to continue. This is now part two. And so many of you have reached out to me and said, or maybe you reached out even to other people and said, my God, how part one of when you have to choose between your home and your God was such a powerful thing for you guys to hear and to learn. Um, and and it, it became so engrossing and so um, intense until we thought it necessary to do a part two and there may have to be a part three and a part four, et cetera, because this is something that is something that's so pertinent and so important to our lives. It's essential to each and every one of us, whether you're married, divorced, separated, or whether you've never been married. Um, or even if you're widowed, it's very important. It's very important if you're in your second marriage, third marriage, fourth marriage, or if, you know, you are engaged. It's important for us to understand because too many of us, we have not received the, the training that is necessary for marriage. And listen, it, unfortunately, even many of us teachers, um, we learn the right thing to do after we messed up, you know, after we messed up, after we had troubles or situations or tri trials or difficulties. And so it's important for us. The word of God tells us that we need to sharpen one another. It says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the continents of his friend. And so it is only my desire to share with you the things that God has revealed to me. Um, it's only my desire to even share it, even at the expense of if I made a mistake in certain areas or if I failed in certain areas. But the one thing that I will not do, I will not teach nor preach Rodney or Pastor Rodney. I will only teach and preach the word of God and what thus says the Lord. It is important to know that um, many of us, we've made all of us in one way or another have made mistakes. But we serve such a wonderful God that he takes our errors, he takes our flaws, he takes our inadequacies, and God makes them better. He makes them better, and he's able to take every mess and change it into a message. He's able to take every junk and change it into treasure. And so I want to encourage you tonight that no matter where you are, and if, even if you hear some things tonight, or even in the first class that, you know, kind of hit home with you. You know, don't you hold your head down. The scripture says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens, he corrects. And so the one thing that I'm grateful for is that every time I hear the voice of God pointing at things in my life, it just shows his great love for me 
because he doesn't want us to be lost, right? And so I want to share some things with you is, um, you know, in reference to this part too. First of all, let's start with the word of God and let's go to Psalms chapter 127. Psalms chapter 127. Amen. And when you get to Psalms chapter 127, we want to look at verse 1. Psalms chapter 127, verse 1. Look at what it says. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Okay? So one of the first things we want to understand is that our houses, our homes must be built by the Lord. Now, um, this particular teaching, I haven't heard too many places because most people either ascribe to or subscribe, subscribe to whether or not like, you know, marriage is is the bed, the marriage bed is undefiled and marriage is honorable before God. And they either ascribe to that all marriages are honorable before God, or they either subscribe to that only when you um, get married to someone who is saved, is it honorable? And then you have other people that says, well, you could be two saved people and not be right for each other, right? So you could be unequally yoked with unbelievers and you can also be unequally yoked with a believer. Um, because you could be in two different levels. You could be have one person that is spiritually mature and another person that is spiritually immature. It doesn't mean that you can't get married, but it may mean that now is not the time. Too often, when we think about marriage, too many of us spend more time only focusing on the intimacy, the love, and the, the closeness, and the joy and the sex and the the covetousness because we want that person only for ourselves and we don't want nobody else to get them. And so you have uh, women that get into relationships and right away they say, you know, if you don't marry me in a year, I'm out. You know, listen, that kind of foolishness, I pray that none of you are doing that because you don't know where each person is. And that woman is not um, testing and, and putting that man through the litmus test on whether he is suitable to be your spiritual head. Good evening, Mason. Um, whether he is suitable and, and wives, ladies, I mean, I, w- I want to ask you, do you really think about this? I mean, seriously, think about this and consider and give prayer to this. Is the man that you're interested in, is he capable of being your spiritual head? And then also the second part of that coin is, are you capable of being his body? Because it is, you know, I've heard so many people say, oh, yeah, the man is the head, but the woman is the neck so she can turn the head where she wants. No, that's ignorant. And that is of the world because of the fact that the neck or any part of the body doesn't move unless the head commands it. So it is the head that is in control of the body and not vice versa. So because of that, women need to start to think that can this man, is this man capable of being my spiritual head, which, which requires for you to think about, you know, uh, is this man capable not only of sharing the word of God and do, does he love God, but does he love you enough to give up his life for you? This, this is key. And if you're in the dating stage, and this man is not giving up everything for you, if he's not surrendering things in his life for you, if he's not making space for you, my friends, you got to seriously ask the question, one or two questions. One, maybe it's not time yet, number one, or two, maybe this is not the one that God has in store for you. Okay, because the Bible says that a single person or an unmarried person must be concerned about the things of the Lord, how they may please the Lord. So if God has not ordained for that person to be married yet, then you could have a man or woman for that matter who are suitable as a spouse, but not yet. 
And too many of us, we've gotten married because of immorality. If you look into 1 Corinthians chapter 7, you will find these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, you'll find, starting from verse 1, it says, Now concerning the things of which you wrote for me, wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch the wo- a woman. Nevertheless, verse 2, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. One of the first things we must realize is that in all of us, there is a level of sexual immorality. It doesn't matter if you are virgin. It doesn't matter if you've been around the block. Um, There's a level of sexual immorality because in your flesh dwells nothing good. In your flesh, there is adultery, there is fornication, there's evil lasciviousness. And so these things are dormant in your flesh. And depending on how much you have yielded yourself to your flesh's desire, those things may be strong or they may be weak. But let me tell you something, that these things are resident within you. God bless you, Veronica. These things are resident within you. And because they are resident within you, what happens is that um, when you connect with someone else, you must ask yourself the question is, where are they on this level? Now, you cannot ask, answer that question and you should not even be engaged in answering that question with somebody who is unsaved. Why? Because they are controlled by the enemy and you cannot have a godly marriage nor a godly home marrying somebody who is ungodly. Point blank. And and we as people of God should be past this. But as a pastor, I cannot tell you how many times I have counseled individuals who get married to people that you know is not saved. You know it's not safe. So when you get married to these people and then now later on you want counsel. No, your counsel is you need to repent. That's your counsel. You need to repent. You need to ask God to forgive you. And listen, you can't repent and then stay in the same mess. This is Pastor Rodney talking. You can't repent because you stepped into chaos. Right. And so now once you step into chaos, I'm here to tell you that I do not believe that all marriage, whomever you want to marry is honorable. I do not believe that. I do not believe that every marriage that you choose to put together is honorable. Why? Because marriage, let's talk about the truth of the matter. Marriage is not a worldly concept. Marriage is a godly introduction and a godly concept. It's a godly concept that was introduced by our heavenly father, spoken through Adam. For this cause shall a man leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. This is why when we have all of these ungodly marriages, you still have the husband who's a, a, a mama's boy. You still have girl, a wife who's a daddy's girl. You still have man that's still acting like a boy. You still have woman that's still acting like a little girl. You still have grown up as acting like a spoiled brat. You still have female grown up acting like a spoiled brat. You have somebody who is matured in age and immature in in character and in spirit. This is why we have so many different nuances in marriage because of the fact of that so many have chosen not to do it God's way. And I don't know about you. If I desire to make a car, I need to understand what it is that a car needs. I need to understand if I'm going to fix a car, I need to start back with the diagram of this car. Even the best mechanics have to look at a mechanic's manual to, to look at things that have been proven and things that are a part of this car in order to know why this car is not acting right. And so many people They're trying to go to everybody else. You have believers, and I'm not talking about worldly people. You have believers that are going to non-believers for knowledge on how to spice up this marriage. 
How how you going to try? It's like getting bad food and trying to spice it up. Put more seasoning. The food ain't cooked. It's still raw. It's still raw on the inside. And you think a little salt and a little pepper is going to make it taste better. No, it's still nasty. I remember um, not too many days ago, um, I, I wanted to make some fish. Right. Because I love going fishing. I always have fish in the house. And, and there was some fish that was given to me by some other people. And so I thought the fish out, cleaned it up. Right. Seasoned the fish, you know, put everything in it. And then once I put it in the oven with all my seasoning and everything like that, when I put it in the oven, the thing started cooking. The smell didn't smell right. And I took the thing out of the oven when it was supposed to be cooked. And when I smelled it, I said, no, this is no good. This is rotten. And so I took the fish and I threw it in the garbage. I don't then try to eat it. And this is the same thing that many people have done. You have walked in rebellion of God. You disobeyed your father. And now you're asking God to fix something that you messed up. Now, I'm here to tell you that the grace of God is so much so that sometimes God will tell you, stay right there. Stay right there. But the Bible tells us in, in other cases, what Fellowship has light with darkness. You can't have fellowship. You're not going to have a peaceful home. And so for those of you who are in a home where the person is unregenerated, untransformed, not born again, listen, you might as well face the the, the case that if you walked in rebellion of God, that God gave you a cross to bear, but you have added weight to that cross. And maybe nobody has told you this and there's a solution for you. So I don't want you to get discouraged, but I want you to understand the truth of the matter because it's not so much the devil. We blame the devil for so many things. And oftentimes what we call the devil is really our own choices because we have walked in opposition to God. In fact, in the book of Revelation, when it talks about the church that have lost their first love, one of the first thing God said, do, he said, because you lost your first love, he says, I want you to go back and do the first works. In other words, go back to the beginning, get it fixed from the beginning. And, and the, the problem is, is that too many of us is trying to put a bandaid on a knife wound. It's too many of us. We got a gunshot wound and we're trying to put a little Vaseline to cover it. I'm here to tell you that it will only keep on bleeding. And, and, and one of the things that um, in, in just in, in ministry and ministering to so many different people, you know, what I find is, is I see what is common is that when a person has married somebody who is not saved and that unsaved person submits themselves to your authority, particularly if it's a husband that's unsaved and he submits himself to his wife's authority in the home and he respects her God, then in those cases, I've given wisdom to the individual to ask God to bless you, to minister to your husband, that your marriage would be your first um, ministry. And in ministering to that man, or to that woman for that matter, then they will come to the knowledge of the truth. But if you have a husband or wife that's adamant about serving their God and you trying to serve your God, I'm here to tell you, you will not have peace in your home, but you can have peace in your heart. And it doesn't matter the chaos you're going through because God gives us the peace that surpasses all understanding. And so let me tell you this. Let me start off with saying this. I am not an advocate for divorce. I am not somebody who believes in divorce. I believe that marriage is for life. But I believe this, that if you go out there and you disobey God and you go out there and you marry an unbeliever, you are only asking for chaos in your life. And there is no guarantee that that person that you chose to marry will ever get saved because you have submitted yourself. Ladies, particularly you have submitted yourself under the authority of a different God and that God will make your days miserable. And yes, God is able to do anything. And yes, God is able to help you in every situation. But guess what? You're going to have to deal with some things that God didn't originally ordain from you. 
Okay? So we want to understand this nuances of marriage because why? Marriage, the reason why marriage is so powerful is because marriage is supposed to emulate Christ. Right? It's supposed to emulate the relationship between Christ and the church, which means that in marriage, and let me share this with you because many people, even believers, don't understand this. Let me ask this question, and, and ladies, I need your honest answer, right? If you say to your husband, Do I look fat? Do I look like I gain weight? Right? And do you want your husband to lie to you? I want you to be honest. Don't, don't, be, don't be fake. Don't be phony. Do you want him to tell you, no, nah, babe, you still look good. You still look great. You look wonderful to me. Or if he was to tell you, yes, babe, you've gained weight. Do you get upset? And does that bother you? And does it make you feel like you're not attractive to him anymore. Be honest. I, I need your responses, right? I need your responses. So do you want him to be honest and tell you, babe, you've gained weight, babe, you're letting yourself go. Um, and you, when he tells you that, you will not hold on to any art. So you guys are saying no, but what does that mean? No what? If I have to ask, I know the answer. <laughs> you want the truth. Teresa said, I want the truth. Um, Andrea said, I want honesty. Yes, be truth. Uh, Joanne says, be truth. Veronica says, no. Okay. Um, be honest, but it will still hurt. Okay. Thank you, Lisa, for that. I'm not married, but I would want the truth. Kiana says, okay. Mary says, I want the truth. Siobhan says, yes, tell me. Okay. But, but tell me the truth, ladies. I want you to answer this question. If he told you the truth, do you feel some kind of way? Be honest. Be totally, totally honest. If he told you the truth, do you feel some kind of way? Lisa says, honest even if it hurts. Amen. Anyone else? I want to know for truth, for sure, for sure. When I get married, tell the truth. Uh, speak the truth in, in love. I'd rather you tell the truth and not cheat because you see better. I would feel some kind of way. Yes. Yes. I feel some way. Yes. I want the truth no matter how it hurts. Yes. It's time to lose weight. Then. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. All right. Respect for the truth. Amen. 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 All right. The reason why I'm telling you this is because ladies understand this. Um, so many of us, male and female, we want for the person to tell me the truth and let me see how I handle it. <laughs> My feeling will probably be hurt. It should not matter whether he thinks what love is in the inside. Yes, truth. Okay. All right. Okay. Let me, let me, let me get into this, right? Yes, because then I will think he may go out there and cheat. Yes, I would be in my feelings, but I would be happy. Okay. Oh, yes, tell the truth. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So listen. Right. The reason why I'm telling you this is because marriage should represent the kingdom of God. Right. And when it comes to the church, the church recognized that Christ came to save us from our sins. He came to deliver us from the evil and to correct us. It is the Holy Spirit that reveals in us our flaws and our character. It is the Holy Spirit that reveals in us. Right. And so. The, the marriage that God wants each of us to have is a marriage of complete transparency, a marriage of complete transparency where I could tell you the truth, right? And you not feel that I see you some kind of way. Okay, L listen, listen, I'm telling you, if you could understand marriage from God's perspective, a husband should be able to tell his wife the truth and vice versa. The wife should be able to tell the husband, I've been gone a while and yes, I want the truth even to her. Okay. All right. So the wife should be able to tell the husband the truth, right? And, and guess what? And neither one feel like you are judging me or you think less of me or you don't love me anymore 
or you don't, you feel some kind of way about me anymore that I know you like that better. So now it drives you crazy to try to get to a size that you would want to get to the, the size that you think that he or she likes and, and, and you forget that love. The Bible says true love covers a multitude of sins, right? And that your husband, the Bible says that God does everything. And listen, I want you guys to hear, hear with your heart that God does everything for us, for our good. So a husband should not be speaking to a wife for his pleasure, but for her good. And a wife shouldn't be speaking to a husband, not for her pleasure, but for his good. That's why the Bible says in first Corinthians chapter seven, that the wife's body doesn't belong to her anymore, but it belongs to the husband. So he should be able to talk about what belongs to him without you catching a case. He should be able to say, no, I don't like what I see you doing in your body. Not because it's, it's not good for me, but because it's not good for you. Right. Um, oftentimes when I've counseled couples and, and listen, I'm telling you, if y'all could see this, then you would make better choices in relationship, right? Because check this out. Oftentimes I've counseled individuals and, and I'll see that the wife will get mad at something or the husband will get mad at something that their spouse has said that you also agree with, but you just don't want to hear it from them. Like you don't want them to really tell you what you feel inside. This is why it, it, it really takes you a while to find the right dress that accentuates the right stuff, the right suit, the right shirt, the right tie, everything that makes you feel some kind of way. Because the truth of the matter is all of us, we want to believe that everybody looking at us sees the best. We want to believe that. But the fact of the matter is the way marriage should be, there should be so much intimacy and so much transparency. Why? Because in the natural, we see each other without the covering. In the natural, we see each other in our nakedness. In the natural, we see each other, all of our flaws, right? We don't just see each other on Sunday and on midweek service, but I see you on the days when you're frustrated. I see you on the days of your cycle. I see you on the days when when uh, uh, <laughs> you put on a wig because your hair is starting to thin out. Uh, uh, you may see the man on the days where he's putting shoe polish on his beard and 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 he's trying the best to pluck out the grays and, and, and you may see see him on the days where he's looking in the mirror and he turns profile to look and see whether his gut is growing. Right. And so every time you see one another, true marriage should say, I still want to be married to you. Right. Because God says he is married to the backslider. He says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And that God says in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so what happens is that the husband, right? And see, Siobhan, you're starting to feel some kind of way already. Look, the husband should look at the wife and no matter what shape she's in, he should love her for her best, right? And that she should understand that the words that he's speaking, um, the words that he's speaking is for her good, right? And the husband should also be fully aware that the words that his wife is speaking is for his good and not because she's judging him or condemning him or mocking him. The fact of the matter, ladies and gentlemen, you know the truth about you. You know the truth. And some of you who have a desire to lose weight, you know that you're bigger than what you should, but you don't want to hear it from the pulpit. You don't want, you darn sure don't want to hear it from Pastor Rodney and you darn sure don't want to hear it from your husband. But the fact of the matter is the Holy Ghost has been no away at your spirit and telling you, you know, you're not good. You know, you're not where you're supposed to be. And the fact is many of us want to get married because we're so used to covering. We're so used to putting forth our best 
effort. Listen, don't you dare lie against the truth and say that the reason why you wear that spank is because it makes that dress fit better. No, you're wearing those spanks and you're wearing that, that control top and you're wearing to control something underneath, not to control the stuff on top. No, you'll wear that stuff to control the stuff underneath. And it's time out for us being immature. It's time out for us being like this way. This is why so many men, when they go to a certain age, they go through midlife crises because we look at other people and we go, oh, he's fine. Who oh, you ladies look at him and say, who that is one hot brother. And you don't think your husband hears that. You don't think your boyfriend hears that. And they hear that stuff and it gets in their mind. And then because of that, they're trying to live at an age that they're not. They're trying to do things that is unnatural for them. They're trying to do things to, to meet your expectation because you have lust and carnality in you. And there's a lot of people that, you know, listen, you got either extreme and Teresa, I see you, but you got, and I'm not saying you, Teresa, but you have either extreme. You got the ones that got control everything. And you got so many extensions in your hair. You got so many extensions on your eyelids. You got so much makeup on your face to cover up your paleness. You got so much. And, and so somebody who meets you, when they see you, they think that's the package I'm getting. And if they are drawn to you because of that package, you got to start thinking what happens when I take it all off? When it happens, will they love me when I take it all off? Will they love me when they see that I don't have that hourglass figure? Will they love me when they see that I stuff things here and there, that I try to, uh, that I get the extra padding? Will they love me when that? So when it comes to marriage, when it comes to marriage, the reason why so many marriages are not the way it should be is because sometimes even us old folks, we're still covering up our flaws and not realizing that for this cause shall a man leave that mother and father atmosphere, that atmosphere where mother and father loves you, but they always told you do good in school. They always tell you do good in here, do good in there. They always tell you, come on, sing, sing. I've seen parents at the church that are like, you know, not particularly my church, but I've seen parents when their kids get up there to do something, man, they're like wolves ready to beat their kids. If their kids don't say Easter spit, a speech, uh, if, if their kids don't sing right and they, they get so upset. And so that child has got to come to the place where they can leave that mother and father atmosphere and be joined to somebody who accept them the way they are, but not the stuff that you yourself know is not right. Not, not to accept you to what you have become, but to accept you for the way God has created you to be. And let's be honest, there's a lot of us who have allowed ourselves to fall apart. There's a lot of us because of the circles we hang in, because of our families, right? Yeah, Teresa, because of our families, because of, of, of the get togethers. And let's be honest, some of our families, some of our families are our worst enemies because we get together and all we do is eat. Some families drink, some families just act all up. And so because of that, you haven't left that atmosphere to know that now you are marrying somebody who may be disciplined. You are marrying somebody who may be at a different level and you got to be able to leave that stuff. And the mistake would be is to think that I'll leave it once I get married. No, you're not ready yet. You have to be prepared beforehand for where God would want you. And the fact of the matter is many of us have not taken the time to say, Lord, if, if it bothers me, won't it bother my spouse? If I'm worried about it, won't it worry my spouse? 
You know, I'm, I've known a lot of people, you know, I know people um, who are constantly doing stuff and I know men who are uh, spraying and stuff in their hair because they don't want to have bald spots. You know, I love my bald head. I love when I shave my hair down. But guess what? I also love my grays. I love my salt and pepper. So I don't put no, no, no shoe polish. I don't put no spray paint. I don't put nothing to make it darker. I don't do any of that stuff because of the fact of that I love the man that God has created me to be. And I thank God for it. And so anybody who knows me, anybody who is connected to me, they don't see a man who is insecure. They don't see a man who is worried about your opinion, but they see a man who has loved the person he, he has become and a man who wants to give his wife all of me, all of me. Right. And so this is the challenge for many of us, and especially even women. There's a challenge for you because there is this worldly mindset. There is this worldly concept, this worldly uh, uh, picture, if you will, that ladies, you need to look like this. And when I look sometime, when I look online, you all start to look alike. Because you all believe that this is the way I need to have my eyebrows. This is the way I need to have my eyelashes. This is the way I need to have my hair. This is the way I need to have my body. And then you follow these trends that won't last. You follow these trends that will not last. And then you're using Facebook and all these other things to change the shape of your face and to make your eyes bigger. And so the person that you are to meet don't even know you because God showed them somebody different. And I'm here to tell you, ladies, don't follow every trend that's out there. Gentlemen, don't follow every trend that's out there. Why? This is important for you to know because what happens when you have to choose between your house and God, when you have to choose between the Lord, the Lord's way of doing things, the word of God says, don't let your adorning be merely on the outside. In other words, don't spend so much time. Come on, think about it. Many of us spend so much time in the hair salon, in the barber shop. We spend so much time in the, the beauty supply store. We spend so much time down the lotion in this aisle. How much time do you spend on your spirit? How much do you, time do you spend on your character, on the, the essence of who you are as a man and a woman as it relates to God? Do you spend more time on that? Because that physical stuff will soon fade away. You can Botox as much as you want. You can drink prune juice and think you're going to keep the skin tight. You can exercise and get your yoga on and do all that stuff. But sooner or later, your body will fade away. And if I have positioned myself to always show my wife only my best, only my best side, only the best side. And I get up almost like um, I think it was the uh, picture, a different world when um, Jasmine and, and the, the, the guy was married. You know, she would get up early in the morning before he got up and brush her teeth, comb her hair and put on makeup and then lay down on the pillow. Right. So that when he wake up, he see her all together. Right. That's cute. But friends, what happens on the day when you oversleep? What happens on the day when you're not at your best? Now you start to feel like this person is going to treat me differently because I've only shown them one side. I can't marry somebody until I see the whole side of them. When I see a young lady that I'm interested in, in this woman, and she won't be honest about her feelings and she won't be honest about her jealousy and she won't be honest about her anger and her envy, that she won't be honest about her insecurities. then guess what? You can't be a wife to me because the spiritual head that I am and how God gives me discernment. When God gives me discernment, I'm going to point it out and say, listen, we need to work on this. If not for my good, but for you. So that you might be better. But if you argue, fuss and fight, then I know what it's going to be in marriage. And so for me, that is not a marriage that is is uh, equally yoked with me. And equally so, I need to feel confident that if she can receive truth from me, then I can receive truth from her. Let's be honest, people of God. If somebody is lying to you about who they are, then you don't want to hear, nor can you trust their spiritualness to handle who you are. Let's be honest. 
And this is why it is important for us to know that when it comes between choosing between our house and God, the first question is, are you a follower of God? Are you a follower of God? Do you follow the Lord? Is that really who you're following or are you following the dictates of this world? Because if you're following the dictates of this world, then let's be honest. How many friends you have that are unrighteous? And you keep saying, oh, I don't do the things that they do, but you love hanging out with them. You love talking to them. And the Bible says two cannot walk together unless they agree. And so I'm here to tell you, people of God, if you find that there's a man and all of his friends are unrighteous, you better believe there is unrighteousness in him. If you fellas, if you're interested in that woman and that woman, all of her friends are loud, obnoxious, dishonorable to their their husbands, I'm here to tell you that woman will dishonor you. She can paint it all she wants. She can dress it up all she wants. But I'm here to tell you that two, the Bible says two cannot walk together unless they agree. And if this is your friend, I don't care if you went to preschool together. I don't care if you grew up together. There are people in my life that we lived in the same house. And to this day, we do not talk every day. Why? Because they're running around going to the bars and the clubs and the discos and they're going to get high and they're getting that. And two cannot walk together unless they agree. So I don't have to tell them to stay away from me because they know Rodney is not going to be doing what I'm doing. And I know they're not going to be doing what I'm doing. So guess what? We can't walk together. If that's your boo, if that's your homeboy, if that's your homegirl, if you guys are always on the phone chatting, you may not be doing what they're doing presently, but there's something in you that desires what they're doing. There's something in you that's interested in what they're doing. And if the person that's interested in you is spiritually minded enough, they will walk away from you. I'm going to tell you flat out, ladies and gentlemen, let me make it straight. Let me make it plain, right? If you are arguing with that person about their hangouts and their crews, I'm telling you, you need to walk away from that person now. Now. Because they're only painting it. They're only painting it so that they can get you. Oh, no, no, no. I don't like them. I don't like them. But every time you on their Facebook page, Every time they're sending you a message, they're sending you a joke, they're sending you an invite. Every time you're on the phone with them, every time you guys are talking and hanging out and going out to the movies, it's because you agree. In your spirit, you agree. And there's a lot of people, and I'm here to tell you the truth, people of God. Most of us put on our best effort in order to get with that person. Let's be honest. I know I have. I know I have, but y'all, I'm too grown and I'm too old right now to be shucking and jiving with anybody. I'm too old right now to be painting a picture as though, you know, look, I I just got to let you know what you're dealing with. I got to let you know flat out who I am. I got to let you know flat out what I like and what I don't like. That way it gives you the, 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 the opportunity to say, you know what? I'm willing to deal with this. I'm not willing to deal with this, but, but don't be say, don't say, don't be saying, you hear that? Don't say that I'm willing to deal with this as long as I can change it later. No. Cause what if it never changes? One of the things that have saved me from a lot of different relationships is that for me, um, my time, my schedule is in God's hands. And so anybody who knows me know that oftentimes I can't plan things ahead of time, like too many things ahead of time, because a lot of times the Lord will tell me to go left when, when everybody else wants me to go right. Um, the one thing I know is that, um, as, as of this point in my life, the Lord has, the Lord has made me unto his servant, his, his slave. And, and oftentimes, you know, the Lord will tell me, I don't want you hanging out with them. I don't want you calling this person. No, I want you to be alone in my presence. I want you to be in my word. I want you to be on your knees 
And I'm like, you know, sometimes I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes I'm saying, Lord, you know, I want to have fun too. Lord, I want to go out and I want to have a good time with them. And the Lord said, no, I want you to be on your knees. I don't want you to hang out. I want you to see that movie. You know, sometimes it's a rarity that I get to see a movie. Sometimes it's a rarity that I get to go out. Um, and it's because of the fact of that the Lord is always having me to do something else. And sometimes the Lord doesn't want me to do anything. He wants me to stay still. And it's in those still moments that God speaks to me and gives me the word for the people. It's in those still moments that I find that the peace of God keeps my mind and my heart. It's in those still moments that I could be in a four room house and yet and still find like I feel like I'm in a mansion. It's in those still moments that I find resolution in my mind and I find peace that surpasses all understanding and I find vision and understanding is in those still moments that I find a calmness in my spirit, that I'm not worried about stuff and I'm not frustrated. And I understand this. I'm in a position where God has allowed me to come to the place that there's a lot of people that come to me for answers. There's a lot of people that come to me for the word. There's a lot of people that come to me with questions. And so I can't waste time. So I can't waste time chilling with you for two hours and three hours on the phone. And and I can't waste time um, just talking about shooting the breeze. So what you doing? Nothing. What you doing? Nothing. What you watching? Nothing. Uh, so how was your day? Good. So how was your work? Good. Uh, so how? Do y'all see this look? I can't waste time with that. You know, it's one of those things that, you know, I even sometimes don't like for people to text me and say, Pastor, call me when you get a chance. I have a question. No, write the question down on your text. Pastor, I have a question. Can you answer this when you get a chance? Here's the question. Blah, 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 blah. Boom. Save me some time. Because the, the, the mission that God has me on is this mission that so many of God's people, they're saved. But we have become so conditioned to these sermons and these messages that talks about pie in the sky in the sweet by and by. And we don't know practically how to live right now. We don't know practically how to deal with that child that's rebellious. We don't know practically how to deal with that husband and wife and that situation like marriage and things like that. We don't know how to deal with it until it, it falls apart and now we want counsel. And so the mission that God has given me is to teach, is to teach. And so oftentimes the Lord will endow me with so much wisdom that I'm like, wow, God, that's good. Ooh, God, that's great. Ooh. And then the Lord will show me how in my own life, how I messed up in that area and what I could have done to make that thing better. What I could have done to transform that thing. And I find myself weeping before his presence and saying, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for the mess that I've done. God, forgive me for the words that I said. God, forgive me. And that takes time, people of God. And oftentimes I will tell the people, don't, don't send me five and six text messaging and six and seven phone calls. No, leave a message. When I get it, I'll call you back. If I didn't call you back in two days or so, then give me another call or text and say, Hey, did you get my message? Because sometimes in all the, 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 the rushing and the going about, sometimes something slipped from my memory. I'm human, right? And so my purpose in life has always been to be transparent to be transparent with every single person that I meet, to let you know that this is what I'm thinking, this is what I'm feeling, and if you judge me, that gives you a pure ground to say whether you want to deal with this person or not, as a friend, as a husband, as a boyfriend, as a whatever, right? As a pastor, you can say, you know, I see people that as a pastor, I have a sense of humor, and so I'll use my humor a lot, and I'll have people say, really, pastor? Would you rather me not say it? Would you rather me not give you the whole truth? Would you rather me paint it up and make it all pretty so that it could be palatable for you? Or would you rather me just offer it to you as raw as it is and give you the truth so that you're not wasting your time further with me? That's my purpose in life. And so because of that, when I have chosen in my life, when it comes to choosing between my home and God, I'm going to choose God every single time. I'm going to choose God because of the fact of that I know that he is the one that upkeeps my home. So now let's, let's look further in the word of God. Let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. And I know I shared a lot with you guys and 
We didn't do a lot of scripture tonight, um, but we're going to do a part three because I want us to go deeper because we're going to go deeper into this immorality, the immorality that's within all of us and how we can identify it and how we can stop its voice from speaking to us when it comes to choosing marriages and relationships and, and also how we can deal with the immorality that's in our spouses, you know, when our spouses are worldly. Because that immorality that's in your worldly spouse is there to defile you. So you have a worldly husband. We need to talk about it. We need to talk about worldly husbands that are doing things with their wives in the bedroom that, that you know is not right. But you feel like you have to do it in order to please him. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about wives who are, who are worldly. You are worldly in your perspective of ministry and, and, and in your perspective of sexual activity until now you are looking for the horse to ride you like sea biscuit. I'm going to say it like that. You're looking for that and you don't have a clue of what a touch can do. You don't have a clue of what true love that God has ordained between a husband and a wife to keep that bedroom from being undefiled. So you got husbands and wives introducing pornography. You got husbands and wives watching pornography and then that husband don't realize I'm watching pornography maybe in the basement or maybe in the attic and then I go upstairs to my wife and I try to exercise what I just saw on her not realizing that when I watched that pornography, there was demons transformed, uh, uh, translated to me, transferred to me. And then now I go and I impregnate my wife with that same mess. We're going to talk about that stuff. And so we're not going to talk about it tonight because we need to break that thing down in such a way that you guys can recognize the immorality that's in yourself that's in your flesh and the education that your flesh has gained in this world by the programmings that you watch, the books that you read, the conversation that you ladies sometimes have at the beauty shop, the conversation fellas that we have at the barber shop, the conversation that you have in your men's club and your female club and your girls weekend away and, and the fantasies and the different movies and and the different reality programs and the programs that you choose to watch on TV, all of those things are giving you a perspective of love. And so because of that, the immorality that's in you is forcing your spouse to be something that maybe they're not ordained or, or educated to be. So what happens, you get married to them and now they don't fulfill your needs. So we're going to talk about that. Right. So tonight I want you to look at first Timothy chapter three. So y'all get ready because I might do that tomorrow night. Y'all get ready because that's going to be. And it's for matured audiences only you immature people, you worldly folks, you're going to be looking at it from a different perspective. But you people that desire to do things God's way, you're going to see it from a perspective that God has taught us in his word, how we are to be in marriage, which keeps that bed from being defiled. And because the bed is defiled, some of y'all need to take your bed and throw it outside tonight. Some of y'all need to take that mattress and burn it. Some of y'all need to uh, take that bed. Yeah, you paid a lot of money for it, but you need to take that bed and get rid of it. And you need to sleep on a cot or air mattress until God teaches you how to sleep properly in your bedroom. Because unfortunately, we have brought so many spirits into the bedroom. So let's look at First, first Timothy chapter 3. In verse four. Now let's read from verse one to verse four. First Timothy chapter three, verse one to verse four. It says, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. <clears throat> the husband of one wife, temperate, sober minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the house of God? Not a novice, 
lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. That's from verse one to verse six. Um, oh yeah, Trisha, we're going to be talking about this on the conference as well. We're going to be getting into this thing in the conference because that's the, the, the perfection of, of oneness and that's the merit, the marital covenant. And so we got to talk about these violations and distortion in the covenants, in, in the covenant that we have and that we have corrupted the covenant. And so because of that, God holds true to his part of the covenant, but many of us have failed in our portion. Okay, so look at what it says. It says, this is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop, right? What is the bishop? A bishop is a person that God has called to manage churches or to manage the church, an overseer, if you will, right? Um, this is what a husband is to his wife. He's an overseer. She is the church. Why? Because the church produces sheep. And so the wife produces children. And so the man is an overseer um, over his wife. And this is why the Bible tells the husbands that you have to be careful how you treat your wives or your prayers will be hindered. Why? Because God takes very seriously your position as overseer. This is why I say, ladies, if that husband or that man that you are interested in is not capable of overseeing your life and you submitting to his authority, then you need not be looking to him for a husband. Not yet, or maybe not at all. You need not. I'm going to tell you. Because what is a church that rebels against his Lord? What is a wife that rebels against her husband, her overseer? He's the one that God holds accountable for your life. He's the one that as ladies, you need to trust in that he has your best interest in heart. So if his attention is divided, he cannot manage and oversee you. He can't. Look at what it says. It says, if he desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. Look at what it says. The husband of one wife. He can't have multiple wives. In other words, he can't have his best friend that he pours into. And ladies, neither can you. You can't have your best friend. How many times have I heard husbands be offended because Husbands have told their wives something and their wives have rejected them. But then uh, your girlfriend tells you the same thing and you accept it from her. And then you tell the husband, well, she didn't talk like you talk. Well, she didn't come at me. She didn't bark at me. The truth is the truth. And the fact is, if you are not able to submit to your husband's authority, to the male authority and listen, when we talk about sexual immorality, we got to also talk about how you got to that place in the first place. Some of us got to that place because you didn't have your daddy in your life. So you never learned how to respect a male authority. So you thought that um, the people who were talking to you was maybe your mama or maybe somebody else or maybe even a surrogate father. That surrogate father, um, he spoke gently. He spoke kindly. That boyfriend, he treated you nicely. He spoke tenderly. You never knew the love of a father that says, you're going to do it because this is my house. But yet and still, he loves you anyway. And he never rejected you. See, when a woman has and a son has a father's love, they know that I am accepted by my father and my mother no matter what. But guess what? Even if you had a mother and father, so many of our mothers and fathers have been distorted. So they have not learned to love their children in the good and in the bad, in the right and in the wrong. And they only barked at their children. So half of the children getting married is trying to get married to somebody that is opposite than their family. So how can you enter into something that you don't even know what I should expect? But you're only entering into stuff, running away from stuff that you received. And so this is defilement that is happening. So the Bible says the husband must be blameless. The husband of one wife, 
He must be temperate. He must know how to control his temper. Ladies, answer this question. That man that you enter in, does he control his temper? Does he control his, his, his sexual activity or when he's mad, he just yells and screams when he's sexual, he just horny. Does he ever tell you no? Is he calm when you're ranting and raving and yelling and screaming? Does he quip back at you? It shows he's not temperate. He has to be sober minded. Is he always pie in the sky, fantasy, always dreaming and never in the sober realm? You got to think about these things. Does he have a good behavior? Does he behave well? You know, this is good teaching. Does he behave well? Is he hospitable to people? And I even say that regarding the wives. Are the wives hospitable to people or, or is the husband embracing everybody and the wife go, I don't like her. I think she's after you. I don't like her. I think she's after you. I don't like her. Cause I think she has, baby, she's 110 years old. I think she's after you. Listen, hospitable. Are they able to teach? Are they not given to wine? What do I mean? Given to my wine. That means they're not given to intoxicating things. Are they not violent? Are they violent? Are they always pushing you? Are they always yelling and screaming, pounding on the table? Pound? Are they greedy for money? They lie about money, financial things. I'm talking about men and women, but particularly men. Are they lying about money? Are they gentle? Are they quarrelsome? Are they covetous? This is mine. Don't touch it. Because it says one who rules his own house. Well, mind you, what is our first house? Our first house is, are these temples. And then our house is now then the, the, the houses that we live in, the churches that we attend, all these things, right? And then as a husband, my house would be my wife. Okay. So she now my house. And then when I have, when we have children, these children are now our houses because we are in all of them. We live in all of them. So he says, if you, if you rule your house, well, having your children in submission with all rever rever reverence, which means that those who live under your roof must be in submission. And I tell this to everybody, if you got children living in your house and they won't submit to your authority, listen, you can correct them, you can chastise them to try to work that rebellion out. But once they become old enough to take care of themselves, I'm talking about old enough, not able enough, old enough. In other words, you old enough to get a job, get out. I'm here to tell you, folks, we are dealing with so much stuff in this thing when you have to choose between God and your household. Many of us are praying Sunday after Sunday about that rebellious grown child who now have decided to not only be grown, but to now have children. Even the world says that if a father or mother is paying child support and then that child now has a baby, that child is now emancipated from their family, from their parents. So that father, or that mother can stop child support because now your child doesn't have a baby, which means your child has now made an adult decision and your child's an adult. But instead, we still nurture them, we still neuter them, and we still color, cover them, we still pacify them, we still pay their bills, we still pay their troubles. And some people are, uh, your child is married, and you're still paying their light bill. You must be out of your cotton picking mind. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, people of God, we got to be wise. 
And the word of God teaches us that there are things that we have to understand. This is why we're constantly praying to God. Oh God, fix my household. Oh God, bring peace in my home. Oh God. But you keep letting an unpeaceful person in who's not submitting to your authority. They want to do what they want. My mother, when we were kids, and, and we got old enough to go to parties and clubs and stuff like that. And we went out on a Saturday to a party. But my mother said, you better be in this house at a certain time. And then when you get in this house on Sunday morning, you go into church. My mother wouldn't leave us home where we could watch her TV, run up her electricity bill, eat her food, invite friends. Up. Are you kidding me? And you know what? Honestly, if we were not respectful of my mother's house, we wouldn't even have a key to her house. Because she don't want us coming and going when we want. The only ones that can come and go are the ones who are respecting her rules and the rules of my father in the house. Otherwise, you had to get out. One time, my mother, I was being rebellious. My mother told you, you got to get out of here. She said, if you don't get out of here, I'm going to kill you in here. And I left and went to my friend's house, right? First, I went to this girl's house and, and I was living with this girl and this girl had a baby. Um, she was Hispanic. She had a baby and it wasn't my baby. And um, she started calling me poppy and poppy this and poppy that. And, and I was like, yeah, I'll be your poppy. Yeah, baby, I'll be your poppy. And, and I was living with her, right? And then she started to say... Um, she started to tell me that she wanted me to be a father to that child. And y'all, I was a, I was a, I was just now in my mid teens and I was like, be a daddy. Right. And, and I was like, no, I just want to have fun. And she was like, no, there ain't no fun here. She said, we can have fun, but there's responsibility here. And I need you to babysit and I need you to help with this rent. And I need you to help with this, right? And I was like, I'm leaving. Why? Because I was immature. I was immature and I wanted to have my fun. I wanted to have my cake and eat it too and not pay for it, right? So I left her house and I went to my boy's house, right? And my boy said, oh yeah, come on, man. You can stay. He had a, a bedroom in the basement and, and, and he said, yo, you can sleep on the couch there and, and I'll sleep in my bedroom. And so like that, he says, don't worry. And he would go upstairs in his house and he would take food out of their refrigerator and bring it downstairs so I can eat it. And then when I, when his family would see, he said, oh yeah, yeah. Rodney came to stop by for a minute. And they was like, oh, cool. They didn't know I was living downstairs. But then one day his older brother came here. And I was asleep in the bed and his older brother came in the house and his older brother said, Rodney is here. He says, was Rodney staying here? And, and his brother said, yeah, he was staying here for a little bit because he had some problems with his mother. He said, didn't you know his mother was asking? She, she didn't know where he was in the church. He said, oh, no. He went in that bedroom and said, Rodney, get up. And he took me back to my mother's house. You ain't going to stay here for free. And I thank God for that. He took me back to my mother's house and y'all, my mother, my Southern mother and my Southern father was like, oh, thank you for bringing our baby home. We were so worried about him. Oh my God. We, oh baby, you okay? Oh yes, yes, yes. They waited until that man left. And I thought everything was cool. I thought, yeah, I made them pay for it. They miss me. My mother read me my right soon as that man left. And she said, let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you this from now on. She says, you got one week, one week to find a job. She says, when you find that job, you're going to give me X amount of dollars every time you get paid. If I don't get it, you're going to be out in the streets. She says, if you don't like my rules, you need to get out now and you will never be welcome back in this house again. Now, back then, I thought she was being a mean old ogre of a mother. But I am so grateful for that mother named Thomasina 
Maple smiling. So glad for her who laid down the law and told me, you're not going to be no lazy bum that's sitting around here waiting for somebody to take care of you. No, God made you into a man. You're going to get up and you're going to do right. Or help me, God, I'm going to halfway kill you. And too many parents have pacified their children. And you know what? Let's, let's be real with this. Why? For some of us, and y'all may hate me for saying this, but I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you the truth before God. Some of the conditions of your children are your own fault. Are your fault as a parent. Because you have pacified them. And you made them think that they could do whatever they want and still be accepted. No, that's not until they mature and get with their spouse and the spouse says, I'll love you through thick and thin. In parenting, it is our job to prepare them for life. And in life, that boss is going to give them rules and tell them if you break the rules, you're going to be fired. And now your son or your daughter can't keep a job because, oh, they don't like me. Oh, I was only late twice. You shouldn't have been late once. The job pays you to be on time. And because we haven't taught them the hard knocks of life, when they go in a job, it is easier for me to stand on the corner and hang with my friends and make my $500 or $5,000 a week than to go to a job and work a nine to five and come home with $200. The $200 is respectful, but you have taught me mama that I don't have to do nothing to get those $200 pair of sneakers. I don't have to do anything. Um, I don't have to, I could barely pass my grade to get every PlayStation and every game box that is out there. I could barely pass my grade and I got an $800 cell phone. I could barely respect you in the house, but I got every outfit known to man. I got every group that I could hang out with and I'm free to come and go as I want. What kind of man you think you're raising? Later for the boy, what kind of man you think you're raising? What kind of daughter are you think you're raising? Because now she's growing up looking for another man who's going to be a sugar daddy. She's looking for another man who's going to tell her her stuff don't stink. And so now when she meets somebody who's a real man or he meets somebody who's a real woman that says, no, you're not going to treat me like this. No, you're not going to talk to me like that. He goes, girl, please, I don't get out my face. And now he want to call her a hoe or call her this because she's an honorable woman and she won't stand for his mess. And that's because mama, you taught him that. That's because daddy, you taught her that. You taught her that she could do whatever she want and still be accepted. No, sir. The house, the home with the mother and father is made by God to set the tone for life. To set the tone for life. Not to pacify them, not to be their friends, not to be their buddies, not for them to sing your praises. No, to set the rules of the house. Because the only thing when you got married, you got married to that man. He got married to that woman and you said, I'm cleaving to you. The Bible said, for this cause shall a man leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. It did not say, for this cause shall a man leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife and his children. No, my children are meant to get out. The Bible says, train up a child in the way that he should go. Most of us only look up, train up a child, and in the end, he won't depart from it. But you forget about that middle place. He should go, should go, should go. They got to get out. And so this is why oftentimes God has it. Um, <laughs> oh, you write about that, Wanda. This is why God has us in a place where um, he, he even tells us 
with our children, you know, like some of the things that happens in our children, these nuances and, and the different rebellious stages that the children go through. It is because God knows that there is stuff that's dormant inside of us. And it's our job as parents to not try to be so friendly with them and not try to be so pacifying with them and accept it to them and accept all of their flaws. And so your house end up becoming a junkyard. Your house becomes a, 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 a residence to, to pack, your, bring all your baggage. That you could leave my house and have babies and come back, bring the babies to me. And you're not going to work, but you just want to hang out with your friends. So you're asking me to watch the baby. Second time tonight. Y'all see that look in my face? Second time. You want to go out there and have the baby and now I got to babysit? No, no, I can understand babysitting if that person needs to go to work or if they haven't found a daycare center yet. But listen, y'all may get offended by this, but my mother, when my mother took care of my child, I had to pay her. Why? Because she was teaching me that when you go out there, they're not going to let you do it for free. So you need to understand now what it is. And guess what? She said, my time is valuable. And now you have made me waste some of my time to take care of your stuff. And a lot of you think that's being cruel, but no, that's love. Love tells you the truth. Love tells you, baby girl. No, like I said in the beginning, for those of us, do you really want the truth from the person you love without catching a case, without catching an attitude? The mere fact is too many of us have not grown past the hurt that we gain from mama, father, sister, and brother. So we're sensitive and we want the person that we're married to, to lie to us. We want them. We want the boyfriends and the girlfriends to lie to us. We don't want them to tell us the truth. Say, so you know what, boo, you're a little lazy. And we got to figure out how to stop you from being lazy. You sleep too much. No, you shouldn't be eating a tub of ice cream at 11 o'clock at night. Didn't you just say you want to lose weight? No, you have high blood pressure. What are you doing with that salt? That's not smart. But I still love you. Not feeling some kind of way, but I'm, I'm, I'm loving you. Oh, you said you want to lose 10 pounds? When are you going to work out with me? When are you going to go to the gym? When are you going to stop eating those bad things? When are you going to start cooking at home and eating healthier choices? But no, you're trying to lose weight, but you're running to the fast food line. You're running to the McDonald's and the Wendy's and the Burger King. Why? Because you weren't disciplined enough to go home and cook some. Oh, oh, Teresa, don't get me started with the folks who come with the, you know, uh, 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 weight loss quick stuff. Oh, take this smooth move so you can lose weight. Take this pill and this medicine because it's going to get rid of the water in your system. No, stop eating so much salt and your body will rid itself of its own water. This is why we have so much cancers going out in the world because all of this manufactured stuff that's out there and all this processed stuff that's out there that's just destroying our bodies. So then we go and, and, and we need, yeah, Trisha, we need smooth move because we won't sit down and eat good food and chew properly. But we're wolfing down food so quick because our appetite loves the salt and the flavor. And so we eat and eat and then we eat too much of one thing, got too much rice in our system and too much of this in our system because it's easy. And because nobody ever told us the truth. You had the parent that sat there and thank God for the parents who your child may want to sing. But if your child is tone deaf, you need to tell them the truth. Boo boo, this is not your gift. So that when they become an adult and they want to stand up in the church, I have a song to sing and they want to grab the mic. No, when pastor tells them, no, back up. Mm -mm, no, sit down, go somewhere and sit down. This is not your gift. 
when pastor tells them that they're not now sensitive because they've learned that's not my gift. But you had some boo that they sang to him and they sang all off key. And the boo said, oh, that's so sweet. That song touched me. So now they think they're a singer. And they sound like a screaming monkey. Nobody ever told them the truth. Nobody ever told them, boo, you can't dance. Boo, you have no rhythm. Boo, boo, yeah, I know you used to cook for your mama, but... Your mama is not here. Let me tell you the truth. You can't cook. Or somebody tell you, you know, I'm tired of you cooking franks and beans. You don't know how to cook nothing else. You got to. <laughs> oh, my God. I hear you, Lauren. Oh, my God. We got so many parts to give you in this because we can't give it to you all. Not in one night. Let me tell you something. <laughs> The home, for those of you who are parents, your home must be a place of truth. It must be a place where you call a duck a duck. Yeah, that's your child. And telling the truth doesn't mean you hate them. It means you love them. For the Bible says, if a parent doesn't discipline their child, it's because they hate them. And so we got to, the home has got to be the platform for truth, not for lie. Ooh, baby, you going to be a superstar one day. Oh, you are my superstar. Oh, yes, you are. And so now you have this child. And I'm, I'm sorry to be in this way because so many of you have not received the truth. So you have this child that want to be a dancer. And you as a parent know Everybody out there dancing are in a certain shape. The professionals are in a certain shape. So you told your child they could eat a hoagie and do all that stuff and still you're going to be mama's superstar. And now you have these kids going out there crying, but ma, they don't like me. They say I'm not good enough because you never told them the truth. You never told them, sweetheart, listen, you want to be a dancer, you got to discipline yourself in this area. Son, you want to be a singer, you want to be a musician, this is what you got to discipline yourself in. Right? And you got to give them all that you know in that area. And you got to push them in the truth. Because if you do that, then the truth is going to make them, the, the truth is going to make them free. But if you keep lying to them, then now they look for somebody in relationship to lie to them. And now once you get married and the truth hits you, then you realize all the years you told that person, oh, I love you anyhow, boo. It's okay. Everything's okay. No, 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 no. You, you're, not, you're not overweight. And now when you let your weight go, and now, this is what we're going to talk about in part three. And now, when you find that when you were dating, y'all ready for this? I mean, listen, we, we need to say this and then we need to close. But I want to know, are y'all ready for this? Just let me know. I'm waiting. Let me know, are you ready for this? If you're not ready for this or if you think that we're getting a little bit too... To on the border fence of, of what you can handle or not handle. Just be honest. You ready? Chrissy, you ready? Amen. Thank you. You ready, Siobhan? Amen. Um, Trisha, we're ready. Amen. Kiana, yes, yes. Raymond, yes. Lauren, okay. Amen. All right. Okay, so you guys are ready. Joanne is ready. Okay. Amen. Teresa, ready. Amen. All right. Okay, so let me tell you this, right? And this is what folks will not talk about in church but we need to talk about and we need to get we need to get a full understanding of this and we're going to talk about this in part three and god's willing i'm going to do this tomorrow and we're going to talk about this and like i said we want to talk about the immorality think about this for those of you who have been sexual before marriage 
And when you were sexual, that person stole your fruit. The Bible says stolen fruit is sweet, but afterwards it's bitter. Now, when you had sex before marriage, <laughs> the natural nuances of a man is a man is stimulated in his mind. Ladies, stop talking like the world. He doesn't have two brains. He doesn't have one down there and one up here. No, it's up here. It's in his fantasy. When a person is being immoral, then unfortunately, let me tell y'all, sometimes you have a bad perception of the way your marriage is going to be. Because isn't it interesting that when you're single, you seem to can't do without sex. You want it all the time. But when you get married, you don't want it all the time. Isn't that interesting? And for those of you who haven't been married, you're going to find out. When you get married and you got the cow, the milk and everything, the whole farm, you don't always want to have sex. But when you're single, you're like, oh man, I can't wait to be with her. I can't wait to be with him. I can't wait to, you know, you want it, right? Why is that? Let me tell you why. It's because when you steal fruit, the, the thing that is stimulating is the forbiddenness of it. That's what's stimulating your man. So let's say if while you were dating, you were a little bit overweight, or let's say you weren't at your best physically, what was the turn on is that he's stealing your fruit. Right? <laughs> um, right, but see, Teresa, you said you wanted it, but guess what? He didn't want it. He didn't want it all the time. My point is this. When you're stealing fruit, the fruit is appealing. It is, it is something that, like, one of the things you find, you know, even I had to counsel some people who were kleptomaniacs. And for them, the joy was in the pursuit of, if I can get it, right? Right? This is why, ladies, and we got to go into this tomorrow. We ain't going to go into this tonight because I'm telling you, it, it's incredible. This is why when you're single, it's more probable that the orgasms of the man will be quicker. And then once you get married, the orgasms become longer. And it's because Stimulation is in the brain. And so when he's doing something that he know he shouldn't be doing, and he's taking something that's not rightfully his, that's the stimulation along with you. <laughs> and so once he gets married and he now owns it, he no longer has the stimulation of the stolen fruit. So now, all he has is you. And if he hooked up with you because of immorality, his immorality says you're not good enough yet. And this is why he wants you to change. So, uh, yeah, I got to leave y'all right there. I got to leave y'all right there. I'm sorry. I got to leave you right there because... Tomorrow is ouch. And so the reality of what you think you have. The, yes, this lemonade stand is closed, Christy. You're right about that. The, the, yeah, the stimuli has changed. Yes, Raymond. Uh, the reality of what you think you have is a false reality because it's based upon a false perception. 
and that false perception, even if you have, oh my God, this sex is off the chain. Once you get married, it's going to change. And so if you have trained your flesh to love it that way, then when you get married, you're going to be sadly disappointed. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you for this time of sharing with your people. And Father, I pray that you would grant each and every one of us holy wisdom and understanding and help us, Father, that we might see from your perspective and not merely our own. Father, we need you. Father, we need you to dispel all myths. We need you to remove all distortions of truth. And we need you, God, to clearly open our hearts and minds so that we might receive and live according to the truth. For you said, then you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And so, God, we want to know the truth. And Father, we want to pursue the truth and we want to live the truth. So help us not to be hearers only of your word, but to be doers of your word. Forgive us for every sin and transgression, every form of iniquity. And Father, I pray that you would open up our eyes that we might see clearly so that we might live a life that is better for you. For God, we desire to live like Christ. So bless us even now. As we lay down tonight, Holy Spirit, commune with our hearts and our minds. For those who are married and who have been doing it wrong the whole way, God, I pray that you would give them the peace of mind to wait until they hear everything so that they might have a clear instruction and clear purpose and clear agenda to do in their marriage. Lord God, remove all distortions. I thank you, Father, for you are Lord, King above all kings and Lord above all lords. There is nobody like you. So have your way in our lives and be exalted. We thank you right now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. God bless you. My God, help us, Holy Spirit. Help us, Holy Spirit, that we might live according to your principles. God bless you, Chrissy. God bless you, Joanne. Listen, thank you, everybody, for your financial giving. Thank you for um, how you have blessed me. And, and I pray that God will continue to bless you as well as you continue to just do what God tells you to do. Um, I love you, not because of your blessings, but I love you with the love of Jesus Christ. And my desire is that you would grow in the knowledge and understanding of the Lord and that you would make better choices so that you might glorify his name. So God bless you, Demetria. God bless you, Tricia. Raymond, God bless you. Jasmine, God bless you. God bless you, Kiana. God bless you, Mason, my brother. God bless you, Joanne. God bless you, Connie. Mary, God bless you. You're welcome, Mason. God bless you, Regina. Amen. God bless you, Angela. God bless you, Wanda. God bless you, Melinda. Thank you, Mason. God bless you. Same as you, Veretta. God bless you, Lauren. God bless you, Elder Nicole. God bless you, Trisha. Love you back. God bless you, Lisa. God bless you, Paula. God bless you. You're welcome. Vanita, God bless you. Camille, be blessed. God bless you as well. Amen. Thank you for joining me tonight. Don't forget to share this video and it will be posted on my YouTube page so that others will know who are not on uh, Facebook. They'll know what we talked about tonight. And so God bless you. Amen. I love you all. Have a blessed and marvelous evening. And I look forward to God's willing to share with you again tomorrow evening at 8 p.m. God bless you. Have a great night and love each other. Amen. Love each other. God bless you, Teresa. All right, everybody, have a great night. Love you.